So today's talk will be talking about uh, Brexit and the work I did uh, analyzing bots talking about Brexit. So uh, I know it's lunch, so I'm going to try to wake you up. Um, but by show of hands, how many of you guys heard of uh, Brexit? Okay. Uh, what about uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica? Close, close to everyone. Um, aggregate IQ. Uh, Aaron Kelly did a really good talk on that last year. I kind of measure uh, Internet Research Agency. Um, what about like g in general Iranian disinfo campaigns or uh, Chinese disinformation campaigns? So. Hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll understand a bit about how these influence operations work, um, how they operate. And uh, my talk is mainly on Brexit, but there's some uh, Canadian stuff I'll talk about as well. So if you're here in the morning, uh, Rene actually brought up a, a report that I cited as well. Uh, Oxford did a really good uh, uh, research uh, on the global disinformation order that came out last month. And uh, they say the following quote, uh, that pretty much Governments all around the world are running influence operations. Uh, some, something like 26 plus countries have been attributed to disinfo campaigns. And uh, that's only nation states. There's a lot of private companies doing this. And uh, if any of you would like to read the report after, I can uh, show you the, the printed copy I have, or I can email you the actual one. Uh, in a nutshell, I'm going to be talking about how I use Brainspace, which is a, a software that Sixera owns to uh, look at disinformation campaigns and use new data sci science, scientific ways of analyzing disinformation and social media data in ways that other companies and research agencies have not. Uh, we're going to be going beyond basic statistics, uh, which is what mainly everyone does. Um, and we're going to be using machine learning, natural language processing, and sentiment analysis to uncover uh, influence ops. Uh, I chose to do my research when I was at Immunity on Brexit, because unlike the 2016 election, it was written about. Uh, but a lot of the analysis was uh, pretty uh, rudimentary. So I thought it was a good topic to, uh, to work on. And uh, just some background. Brainspace is uh, traditionally made for e-discovery, which is like a legal thing people use. Uh, you ingest typically like case files from a, from, a, from a lawsuit. And it'll do a bunch of statistical analysis. It'll group individuals, phone numbers, everything together. Uh, most of the clients that purchase it today use it for, for the legal industry. But there's other applications of it that we'll see today. This is a general breakdown of my presentation, so you know what to expect. I'm not going to talk about, I'm going to talk about all these, but I'm not going to read them. So we'll see them. So uh, in general, bot people that run influence operations constantly change their TTPs, techniques, tactics, and procedures, because there's always a catch-up game between uh, the people running these disinformation campaigns and the people combating them, like the people that write reports, like the, like the people like Renee that work on uncovering what's happening. So some of the historical ways that we've been able to detect bots, uh, these are some characteristics. Uh, the Internet Research Agency and, and bots similar to it, well, they would post 24-7 you know, at odd hours, like Moscow time. Uh, pretending to be Americans. Uh, those accounts on Twitter would have uh, extremely high amounts of interactions, uh, but they only like retweet people. They're not going to post anything original. Uh, at the beginning, they used uh, pictures pulled from random websites that were easily reverse image searchable. Um, sometimes they would have handles with uh, like, like Jeff Smith 0069423, which is like not a normal handle that someone would use on Twitter. And uh, sometimes they would use uh, third-party applications to post tweets. Um, and you could see that in uh, a lot of the previous work other people have done. What people are not good at is looking at sock puppet accounts. So accounts that pretend to be someone that they're not. They might be operated by, a, I think, a, Rene called it a cyborg. Like, a, it's a person running it. But uh, they're, they're semi-automatic or not automated at all. Um, and uh, there are tools like Botometer that can find a lot of the old ways of detecting bots. So the goal of my, my research was to, to look at bots that are highly ideological on Twitter. So uh, they're talking about politics, but they're very like pro this, anti that, very pro this ideology, anti that ideology. And I want to do it in a way that's very scientific and data science driven. 
So the target for our research was uh, Theresa May. At the time that we were doing this research, she was the Prime Minister of the UK. And she has a public Twitter account. What we did was uh, we, we uh, ran a Python script that would scrape her most recent 100,000 followers. And from that, from each of those uh, accounts, take their 200 tweets, retweets, and who they're interacting with. We would also take uh, attributes of those tweets, like uh, what time of day they sent it, what application they used to post the tweets, and uh, we ingested that all into Brainspace. This is a technology stack of how the research uh, uh, looks from the back end. Uh, we have Python using, uh, using some, some open source software. We pulled all the data. We did some data engineering to clean it, and then we ingested it into Brainspace as a DAT file, and we mapped all the fields to their appropriate uh, attributes. And we made sure, and Brainspace does a lot of work uh, by itself when you ingest data, like um, natural language processing, translating, and a lot of search tools. So before you do any data science project, you really want to understand what you're working on. You just won't, don't want to throw garbage data into a neural net and expect good quality results, because you're not going to get that. At the beginning of this project, there was a lot of data exploration work that had to be done, so me as an analyst can understand what's going on. Uh, Brainspace has this really cool feature where if you look up a search term like, like wine, um, you're not just going to get tweets that say wine. Uh, Brainspace, using a lot of like math, and there's a whole data science team behind this, uh, they can find terms that are related to the word wine. Like, uh, I don't drink, but I know like these are some of the types of uh, wine types there are. And this is a guy that maybe makes wine. So if you have a limited set of keywords that you know as an analyst or search terms, it'll find using its, its, its uh, the way it works, it'll find similar terms that'll help you find suspicious documents or tweets. So we're looking at uh, tweet behavior uh, in that uh, like bots, they operate like marketing bots. They, they're tweeting out, they're trying to push a message out. And um, they're doing that to stay relevant. And uh, we're looking at content and behavior as opposed to just like uh, languages. So we're looking for more of the inherent behaviors that these accounts have. One of the first things I did when I uh, did this research is um, we, uh, in, in, the, in the data set, uh, you might be wondering why Trump is here. Uh, on Twitter, Trump is one of the most mentioned people on Twitter. People add him, subtweet him, talk about him all the time. And uh, coincidentally, like a lot of his data was in our data set as well. So if you click on his node in Brainspace, you have this beautiful UI. And it'll show you the top accounts interacting with him. And if you can see, there's, uh, there's burst patterns here, there, 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 everywhere. So this is kind of indicative of a, of a bot. It's tweeting out words. Now that many people are tweeting to it, uh, you can kind of tell it's trying to push a message. A normal person, when they're talking on Twitter, imagine like one of these tables. There's like five, six of you there. You're going to be talking to each other. It's going to be more like a mesh network. This is more like just stars. If uh, we're going to look at uh, this suspected bot right here, and uh, as you can see, it only tweets outwards. It sent 96 tweets. It receives zero. Uh, this Twitter account is so active, and if any of you guys want to look it up right now, this is a bio. Uh, it's talking to State Department, Trump, Sean Hannity, uh, Meliana Trump, Netanyahu, State Department. And uh, the bio is really suspicious. It's like, I'm a woman. I'm a judge in Anchorage. Uh, there's like Unicode characters that aren't like being trans. They're not showing up correctly. And I went through her followers, and this was one of them who has a very similar bio. Uh, they have a lot of followers and followings. And I reverse image searched a lot of her pictures. It seems to be pulling from some private Instagram account. Uh, it's still active today if you want to look at it. This is uh, using the UI again. We're looking at an account that talks, that tweets at Trump and tweets at uh, Jacob Reeve Moss. Nigel Farage and Theresa May. It's this one in the corner, it's tweeting outwards. We can see that uh, it, it follows the same pattern as the previous account does. Receives some tweets, 
but most of the search terms associated with this account, you can see it's like get paid to retweet, get paid to like, get paid to post. This is a, one of those uh, accounts that you can interact with and you pay it money and it'll push a certain hashtag or, or, or give you likes. Uh, but interestingly, this account was talk, doing a lot of political work too. I was talking to Nigel Farage, or at least retweeting him a lot. So, so the methodology we used for this, uh, for this research is we wanted to make four buckets of ideologies to look at. We wanted to look at pro-Brexit people, anti-Brexit people, pro-Trump people, and anti-Trump people. And we want to see how these uh, groups interacted either independently in their own ideology or uh, talking about different ideologies at the same time. This is a screenshot from Brainspace on um, the number of tweets I trained the pro-Brexit classifier on, the number of tweets I tro trained the pro-Trump classifier on. And um, this pretty much eliminates uh, having to manually go through thousands of accounts or thousands of tweets and uh, labeling them individually. Uh, Clemson University did a, did a really cool research on the Internet Research Agency, and they looked at manually about 3,800 accounts, and they classified each as like pro-Trump, conservative, liberal, et cetera. But 3,800 accounts to look at is insanely time-consuming and FTE-consuming. So we don't want to do that because that doesn't scale, and we're smart people. We can utilize um, methods we've learned in data science to help us solve these problems. So we have this feature in, uh, in Brainspace called CMML, which stands for Continuous Multimodal Learning, which is pretty much how our uh, program will classify um, tweets based off of an ideology. So I trained uh, this one to be, uh, look for pro-Brexit tweets. I only needed to look, find like six, around 60 tweets. And uh, once you train it, it'll go through the 4.8 million tweets that we have in the data set. It'll find accounts that talk about Brexit five times or more. So we consider these like highly political accounts, but they're also highly, highly ideological when it comes to Brexit. And it would give each of these uh, accounts, each of these tweets in the 4.8 million, a score from zero to one as to how ideological it is being pro-Brexit. This is uh, the process. So at the beginning, it's doing the data exploration, and then it's training the model then you run the model and data set to give every account a score. And then we use Brainspace's API uh, using a small Python script to give each tweet and each account, uh, well, each account holder a score between 0 and 1. Then we're going to filter through that list and look for the top 30 in each ideology. So we're looking at the top 30 in pro-Trump, anti-Trump, pro-Brexit, anti-Brexit. This is manual OSINT work to detect and classify their bots. Um, doing the OSINT on individual accounts, these are some of the tools I used. Uh, if any of you guys do reverse image searching for your uh, work and investigations, uh, Google Image Search is the most common one that people have heard of. Uh, you feed it an image, it will find if there's any variations of that image online. However, there's another program that the Russians built in, uh, in Yandex that's so much more uh, accurate uh, when it comes to facial recognition and image detection. I use that to uncover a lot of people that I couldn't find uh, with Google Image Search. For example, like I found a suspicious account, and it, it was just a guy um, with a with the webcam, and I was like, hey, like this is kind of weird looking. I reverse image searched it in Yandex, and it came up with this dating profile on some other website with a different image, not even the same image. So with that, I can tell like, hey, maybe this guy's just very pro Brexit, but he's a real person, and his I did some OSINT on him in iSeq, which is like a it's like a Google with like a buckets. And pretty much, if you have a, the, the real name of a target, uh, you can find out if they're actually real because you can find documents that relate to them. I also used a bottle meter as a eyeball whether account was suspicious. So bottle meter is something that I think Indiana University created. It's free. You feed it a, a handle, and it'll give it a score uh, and a percentage of like what it thinks if it's a bot or not. Uh, I use that pretty much just to uh, check my work. Uh, but it's not always accurate, uh, but it is a good tool in our tool set. So these are some of our results. In the pro-Trump, 
bucket, we saw that 50% uh, of them that were highly ideological in our data set were bots. In the pro-Brexit, we saw that 66% of them were bots. And then we looked at the intersection of these two uh, lists, and the top accounts in this list, 38% of them were bots, while the rest were, were not bots. But what, what this may imply, uh, it's not guaranteed, is that whoever's running these bots may feel a use to re reuse their pro-Trump accounts, also to push pro-Brexit tweets. We looked at the anti-Brexit and anti-Trump side as well. And the anti-Trump, individually, we saw that about 17% were bots. In the anti-Brexit, we saw that around 17% were bots as well. And accounts talking about both were, were slightly more at 23%. So there's someone or some organization or some nation state. I mean, attribution is not in my scope of research. But there are some groups that are pushing bot messages when it comes to these two ideologies and their combination. Then I figured, like, what kind of person is pro-Brexit and anti-Trump? People tend to, if they're right wing in one country, they tend to ally with the right wing in another country, just because ideologically it's, it's similar. There was an intersection between anti-Trump and pro-Brexit, and 23% uh, of them were bots. And to me, that's really interesting. It, it, maybe people are actually like that. Well, a large portion of them are real, but there are bots in this. And it begs the question, who are running, who is running an operation like this that benefits to being both of these ideologies. Similarly, we did it also with uh, anti-Brexit and pro-Trump. So you can see that 10% of them were extremely uh, pro-Trump. But for some reason, they, they, they didn't have good things to say about Brexit. Uh, again, this is just strange to me. Uh, I haven't met anyone that is like that. But then again, I don't live in the UK, uh, which was the topic, the focus of our research. So. Uh, we also looked at a bottle meter and how, how we, we used bottle meter as a benchmark to see how is it doing compared to the, what we built. And we saw that 78% of the time, it agreed with our analysis. But bottle meter was really bad at finding uh, sock puppets and cyborgs and telling us if they were bots because they're acting more like humans. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's just one more evidence, that's just another piece of evidence to suggest that the tools we built to look at uh, the 2016 election and how bots used to operate aren't as relevant anymore. So uh, what's the takeaway from this? Uh, we know that pro-Trump and, and pro-Brexit, that subsection is heavily driven by bots. And uh, we want to try to find out who runs these. Or It's just interesting to know that uh, there's someone interested in pushing this message. We also saw that uh, bots push these combinations of ideologies. So this may imply reuse of accounts between uh, whoever's running um, these operations. Or it may imply that you know, humans hold multiple ideologies at the same time. You know, we're, we're, we're sophisticated animals. Like, we can have simultaneously be allied with one government in one country and be allied with another government in another country, even though their ideologies don't match. Uh, the other takeaway is that uh, you know, bot makers are constantly changing the way that they do their work. They're constantly changing, um, being detected by, by, by the methods that researchers are writing about. So in fact, my work might be an underestimation of how bots are actually talking about politics online and Brexit online. So when it comes to Canada, we saw uh, before the election, Canada was work, uh, very concerned about Twitter being used for misinformation, like it was used uh, during the 2016 election in the US. I'm not terribly familiar with Canadian politics, but we had a government official called Gold saying that uh, Twitter needs to be more responsible about the way it uh, deals with uh, misinformation. And it needs to work with the Canadian government to find ways of uh, mitigating that risk. We also saw the Gen Canada Declaration on Electoral Integrity online, which had a subsection that talked about bots. And uh, there were some articles on how uh, Facebook said it wouldn't remove this information or doctored uh, um, tweets or posts during the Canadian election, which is very concerning to a lot of you in the crowd being from the Canadian government. After the election, uh, election just happened, uh, research takes some time to complete. 
uh, but from the, from the get-go, there were some people like Marco and Jones that did some preliminary research uh, finding misinformation and disinformation in uh, election discourse online. He looked at uh, pro-Trump accounts that are pushing anti-Trudeau hashtags, and he did a great Twitter thread on this, and uh, later came into a Washington Post article, which I would suggest you look up. Uh, first draft also did a similar research on how uh, Boris Johnson was uh, being uh, boosted by suspicious accounts uh, when it came to Brexit. Uh, both, of these, both of these research is not as data science-y as you would, uh, you would think. When it comes to Mark Owen Jones' research, he does great work, but his research classified a pro-Trump account as an account that had pro-Trump hashtags and keywords in its bio. That doesn't take into account like people on Twitter that, that may be pro-Trump, you know, anti-Trudeau, that don't have anything related to Trump in their, in their, in their uh, bio because they want to hide. So I think that Mark Owen Jones' work underestimates the influence of bots during the Canadian election. And when it comes to the uh, Boris Johnson uh, research, he only looked at about 100,000 accounts. Uh, we're looking at 100,000 tweets. We're looking at 4.8 million tweets. So um, his, and, and the first draft only did basic statistical analysis when it came to this research. So I think that uh, the work these people will do is great because it's a start and these are all people that do it in the private sector. They're not, they're not related to the government. It, it requires more research. We, uh, we know that uh, Canada has a lot of tensions with uh, uh, the country of China right now. Back when I was doing this research, uh, Huawei's CFO was arrested uh, here in Canada. Um, pressured by The U.S. government is pressuring Canada to uh, deport her to the U.S. where she, uh, I think, is being indicted for violating sanctions or some, some rules related to Huawei. Uh, but, but coincidentally, I, uh, when I went on Brainspace, I did this. I wanted to look at Chinese bots and see if they were in my, in my data set. So I looked up, show me all the tweets that say Chinese, and I found this cluster around Trudeau. And then I was like, show me all the tweets in Chinese that say uh, the CFO's name in Chinese. And I found this one tweet uh, by the handle is uh, Love Gao Meng, which actually I noticed today it has the, the lady's name in it. And it was tweeting, it was subtweeting Justin Trudeau. And it said in Chinese, we want the immediate release of her. And uh, if you go, this account is live as well. You can look it up right now on your phone if you wanted to. If you go through its following of followers, there's an entire network of bots that are also pro Huawei talking about Meng Zhen Hao. So even though my data set had one tweet, because the tool allows me as an analyst to dive deeper into Twitter data, I was able to use this to look at more Chinese tweets. That wasn't the focus of my research. So I'm just going to let you guys look into that if you choose to. But I think it's very interesting that uh, Canada uh, may be facing uh, you know, influence operations. At the very least, when it comes to Huawei, uh, there is a possibility it'll also happen during the federal election. Uh, more research needs to be done to look at that. So we're going to talk about attribution. This is a very difficult uh, problem. Uh, there's a, according to the Oxford report, there's over 29 countries, nation states, that are active in doing influence operations on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media websites. And uh, that's only nation states. There's also private companies that can do this work. Um, it, it's just such a massive list that we don't know. And without back-end Twitter data on like login, IP addresses, what phone numbers were related to accounts when they were created, we can't attribute this, this data. I, I would love to work with Twitter and see if I can get that. Uh, when we're talking about national security, our threats is a combination of capability and intent. Most countries in the world, I think, have an intent to have a positive image about either their country or whatever political party is in control at that moment. The capability might have been a little difficult in 2016, and we know the uh, Internet Research Agency worked on it. But since then, people have written so many papers on it, there's so many bots, uh, there's so many marketing tools you can use to, you know, push a product or SoundCloud music, that uh, the capabilities is is so easy that you can go on GitHub and probably find a bunch of tools that can help you with your work. Uh, other people have written about how propaganda as a service is another um, another um, economy rising up in the dark web economy and cybercrime economy, and uh, that's also not the focus of my research, but 
people, nation states can have probable deniability if they launder their influence operations through private companies. So uh, Rene, as a group at Stanford, released a report that was published in the Washington Post and a white paper on how Russia was influencing disinformation in Africa. And uh, I had found a really interesting uh, account when I was um, doing my research. Uh, it was uh, on the list of accounts that tweeted at Donald Trump a lot. And it's called US Africa President. It, it, it kind of masquerades as an official US government account. It masquerades as like a State Department type account. Uh, if you go through the timeline, it retweets like US aid and other organizations that's related to the United States and what the United States is around the world. Um, but, the, but the bio, they have a, a website that is not a US government website. It's like a, kind of like a WordPress website. And uh, it was marked as suspicious by Twitter when I was uh, looking at it. And uh, I went down the timeline. It has uh, about like 6,000 tweets, 7,000 tweets. And, and one weird retweet from this account was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Russia. There's no business for a US government account to be retweeting MFA Russia. So there is a possibility that Re Renee's research focused on Facebook data. Uh, the Russians may have also been doing stuff on Twitter uh, because that's used a lot in Africa. So we have bad news. Um, when it comes to Brexit, Boris Johnson talked about how um, he, well, there's reports that he's holding back a, re a report on um, election interference from the Russians and other foreign nations into Brexit. And uh, he wants to hold it, on, hold it off until the election happens in the UK. And I think that's a bad idea because uh, we, are not, we don't know the impact that this may have. In the US, we had the, the Senate report, Senate Intelligence report on the IRA. That opened the doors for researchers to dig through those handles, dig through that data, and uh, do the great analysis they did after the election. Uh, Facebook is also uh, not doing, I don't, in my personal opinion, I don't think they're doing the best in combating this. Uh, I love this picture uh, of Mark Zuckerberg uh, because pretty much uh, he said uh, when it, in response to Elizabeth Warren's um, that politicians are allowed to post fake news on, on Facebook. And uh, most people are like, that's messed up. Like, if something's not truthful, you know, you shouldn't be able to pay for it and amplify it and, and spread it among normal people on Facebook. There was, in fact, a person in, a, in a California who ran for a, a local election just so he can legally be considered a politician. And he said his intent was to put fake news just to prove a point. And then Facebook said, hey, you can't do that because uh, that's a violation of our terms of service. So we see this kind of, there's a bit of hypocrisy uh, when it comes to Facebook dealing with uh, misinformation on their website, especially paid posts. The good news is uh, I think Twitter is being a lot more proactive about this problem because from Twitter's point of view, they want the, the quality of, of, of their product to be very, very good among normal people. So uh, Jack said uh, back in October, he made this big announcement, you can see 100,000 retweets, that hey, we're not going to allow any political advertising globally. That is a very big deal because there's so many um, campaigns and uh, politicians and think tanks that push messages on, on Twitter. And now he's saying like politicians should earn impact offline as opposed to just paying for that exposure on Twitter. Uh, Twitter also did an amazing job uh, when the rise of ISIS happened in 2015, 2014, 2016. On because uh, universally people agreed that ISIS should not have a platform to spread propaganda and media on their site, so they did a lot of cleanup. Uh, Twitter used to be that you could find ISIS propaganda, beheading videos everywhere, and now. Um, it's much more difficult to find that. And, and they brought all sorts of algorithms and they had all sorts of teams focused on that. We know that these companies have uh, the capability to combat these issues if they choose to do so or if they have pressure from their users and or governments. Um, some of the lessons learned from my, my personal project is, uh, since this was mainly like an open source intelligence and data science project, uh, when you're dealing with a lot of data and accounts, um, you're probably going through hundreds of, of accounts uh, per week. 
uh, and it's hard to backtrack and look at what you found like a week ago if you didn't take a screenshot. Uh, there's, a, there's a program made by a Canadian, uh, Justin Seitz, called Hunchly, which archives everything as you do your investigation. And uh, he couldn't make it to the conference this year. But I would, if I was to redo this work, I would definitely use Hunchly to record all my evidence and uh, write better reports at the end of the day. Also, when doing open source intelligence investigations, you want to use a virtual machine uh, dedicated for that specific project because you don't want whoever is, uh, if it's a nation state that's doing, that's doing this influence operation, you don't want them to know that, hey, like the parliament building or like the intelligence community IP address is like going to my website. Like that is a major OPSEC violation. Using dedicated VMs would uh, protect from that. And uh, you also want to build your own tools for automation so you're not doing a lot of manual analysis like uh, Clemson did with the IRA research or First Draft did or Mark Owen Jones did. It's just more efficient. You know, we're smart people. We can code um, to, to get better results. Um, additionally, you want to use uh, clean Twitter accounts um, when you're doing this research. Twitter has a way of recommending accounts similar to what you're following. So if I follow like one or two Chinese propaganda accounts that I suspect are like ran by the nation state, uh, Twitter might recommend me like people that they're following or followers of them. So it'll get a lot of work done for you. But if you have an, your personal account you're using or another account you're using to do this research, it's going to be uh, dirty with all the noise of all the people you legitimately follow. Additionally, I did see that some of the accounts I was following, um, they had blocked me because they, 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 they suspected that I was researching them, which is not good for my OPSEC. Um, so you want to keep it clean. Um, and these actors are sophisticated. You know, they have a lot of money behind them. Um, don't expect your job to be done. There's no one solution for taking care of misinformation. It's a constantly evolving threat. And I think like the country of Estonia is like really uh, forward facing when it comes to combating misinformation. Not only do they have um, a digital team that tracks misinformation, they also educate their uh, civil society as to, you know, don't believe exactly what you see online because where they are in geopolitically, um, there's, a, there's a big chance that what they're seeing is, is meant for them to see to change public perception on specific sensitive issues. So brain space is not only for, uh, for, for propaganda and bot detection. There's a lot of other cool things you can use. Um, previously, before I joined Immunity, uh, we had revisited the um, Internet Research Agency uh, data set. Uh, we looked at Clemson's research, and we were like, what can we do that no one else can do? So we have a uh, look up this blog post and look at the video on Vimeo that, uh, that um, is associated with it. Uh, one thing we found with the Internet Research Agency tweets was uh, there was a specific apostrophe that the, a lot of the accounts were using to tweet. And it's an apostrophe that's unique to Russian language keyboards. So even though like, your, uh, the tweet may say, like, don't vote for Hillary, um, that apostrophe looks normal to like, a person reading it. But when a, when a computer is parsing that, uh, those characters, it knows that the ASCII code for that character is different than the ASCII code on an English language keyboard. So with that small nugget, you can filter through your entire data set and find uh, accounts tweeting with characters that may be found only on um, Russian keyboards. The other work I did at Immunity was uh, computational counterterrorism uh, stuff, We're finding terrorists and extremists using uh, brain space and big data and machine learning. Uh, Dave Ato, our CEO, gave a really good talk at the International Counterterrorism Conference in Israel, I think about a month, uh, two months ago. And uh, he went through using uh, a lot of the features that we didn't use for our um, project specifically, but can be used for other projects. And if you're interested in this, uh, I definitely encourage you to look that up. For that project, we used uh, Google's Vision API, which can automatically translate, reverse image search, uh, do uh, image labeling, and it can do optical character, character recognition on uh, images on the fly. So like for example, this picture, it's very hard to see, but it's a eulogy to, to Osama bin Laden. And the tweet doesn't have any text, it just has that picture. But in, the, in, the, um, in that image, it says his name in Turkish. Uh, it doesn't just say Osama bin Laden, it says Sheikh Osama bin Laden. And you know that uh, when people tweet these, uh, these words like Sheikh, or like the great, 
it implies a sort of reverence towards these characters. And using those, uh, that kind of sentiment analysis, you can, um, you can filter through just like researchers talking about bin Laden that are legitimately doing that just for, for research on Twitter and talking to people, to people that are uh, potentially extremists or extremist sympathizers that are on the platform. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. If I want to make a document of all the people doing disinformation research, it would be massive and it would be like a 30 page Google Doc. Uh, but before, before this uh, conference, I'm like, hey, what are some of the coolest research I saw that isn't going to take you too long to read, that's going to get you up to space, on, uh, up to speed on uh, misinformation happening um, and how to find it? Uh, Bellingcat this is, did this really good research on pro Indonesian propaganda bots, and that's the URL for it. First draft, even though I disagree with the way they do their analysis, they have a lot of projects, and reading through it, you can get some really great ideas on how to, how to um, model your own research in a good way. This is um, the Stanford um, Center that deals with um, digital issues. That's the one that Renee works at. They also have a lot of white papers on uh, predominantly Facebook misinformation, disinformation campaigns. And uh, Trend Micro had a really good uh, blog post. It's, it's a massive blog post on how they used uh, Twint, which is a Twitter data scraper, to, to similar to what we did, scrape a large amount of uh, tweets and filter through for uh, looking for hackers, looking for CVEs, and looking for discourse on those topics. Um, if you want to replicate this research using uh, free tools, I would definitely say check out that blog post. The, um, the last thing I want to talk about, since most of you are in the, uh, in the um, keynote by Renee, is uh, Renee brought up some stuff that um, I, I don't necessarily disagree with, but I think I could expand on. Uh, I think it's great that we both refer to the same paper. It's a great paper by Oxford. So if any of you guys want it, please contact me and I'll email you a copy. Uh, but there was a gentleman in a blue striped shirt that asked, uh, can you use sentiment analysis to uncover uh, disinformation? Right there, my man. And uh, she was like, we're not there yet. With Brainspace, we are. That's the crux of what I did. We, we used natural language processing, sentiment analysis, to filter through what we had and find accounts that uh, were similar to it. And the workload, the FTEs you take is a lot less because you're training it on very clean data. Well, you want to train it on as clean as you can get data. And it'll do the work for you. Um, the other way that we used uh, sentiment analysis is one of the pet projects we had before I got here uh, at Immunity was uh, we looked at um, Ted Cruz's Twitter account and uh, what kind of people were very pro-Second Amendment and anti-Second Amendment, and if the pro or anti groups had bots among them. And I think we have a Vimeo video on that. Uh, if I find it, I'll tweet it. Um, but that was another application of, um, of this research that we had done before. And there were a lot of bots found in that uh, data set. If you guys use Twitter and you're interested, do follow the, the Grug. He is one of the most awesome generalists when it comes to the field of propaganda, disinformation, and influence operations. I learn so much every week just by going down his feed. I think um, you guys should follow him. He, he kind of aggregates a lot of this data and he writes blog posts on it. If uh, you guys want to uh, get the slides, I'm going to put them up on, on my website in a few days. Uh, just uh, follow me on Twitter, and I'll tweet it out uh, when I get back to Miami. Um, if you want to contact me directly, you can email me at me at zishanaziz.com. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, or uh, you can just pull me aside here if you want to talk more details or if you have specific questions. But uh, it's time for Q&A.